Anda bersama saya Cutnya Deviana Daud Syadi Daya Indonesia Fine Arts Academy. Hari ini kita akan berbincang bersama teman baik saya, boleh dikatakan sahabat dari Amerika Serikat, namanya Veronica Nan. Kita akan berbicara mengenai vocal jazz. Nah, ini adalah Veronica Nan dari New York. yang mana juga merupakan partner daripada uh, dari dari Mr. Michael Franks. So, let's welcome Veronica Nan. Hi, how are you doing? Hi, Dee. How are you? It's good to see you. Yeah, I'm good to see you too. You look gorgeous. Ah, so do you. <laughs> <laughs> so okay. do you. Yeah. Well, um Today we're going to talk about about the brief history of jazz music. And I think well, you have a lot to tell about. Oh yeah, yeah, this was uh well what I'm going to start off with is I'm going to start off with from the 1600s, 1600 mm-hmm. to 1800. Yes. And um how I'm going to do this is I don't think it's possible really to talk about jazz history without delving into African American history because the two of them are you know they're so closely linked mm-hmm. and they're so connected and one can't really exist without the other. Um and also I can't you know begin to sum up the history of jazz music and jazz vocal especially in this time that we have a lot of it. Uh-huh. The series we only have a, you know okay. a few minutes yeah. per, per episode and I cannot also sum up the history of the American African American people. created this beautiful unique and uh, uh, special I... art form. But what I can do is I can share some information that may help people understand the roots of this music and its evolution and how it's directly connected to the landscape of its art. Okay, so now I'm going to start briefly uh jazz history, jazz history. Yes. It began about 400 years ago around 1600 when the English, French, Spanish, Portuguese, and Dutch competed for the control of the Atlantic slave trade. Yes. Okay? Now this human atrocity uh it it ravaged populations of Africa, but primarily the regions uh that we now call Ghana, Togo, Benin, and Nigeria. This is where they pulled a lot of the African slaves from. Right. And these he, he, these human beings were being transported mostly to the Caribbean islands and the Spanish colonies of Central and South America. Mm-hmm. Now, they say that it's only estimated about 6% of these victims of slavery were traded in British North America or what we call the United States. So, I wanted people to kind of get uh uh to envision for a moment um how slaves were transported. Mm-hmm. Uh mm-hmm. if you think of it like sardines in a can, they were uh laid side by side really close together packed in just all packed in and you know if they had to go to the bathroom or if they were sick from the sea they threw up or they had to you know lay in their own human waste and uh sometimes you know they were next to africans of different tribes that didn't even speak the language that they spoke yeah and i you you have to envision how frightening that could be and and all of the unknown and and Perhaps they may have sung some songs to themselves to kind of soothe the situation. Mm-hmm. And so these people from all over uh this section of Africa are, are far away from their home. They're not uh 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 everything seems so strange and foreign to them. And these people have such a diverse uh diversity in linguistics, in their ethnic and their spiritual her- heritage. Yeah. And all of that together We have to keep that in mind as we envision this journey from Africa to the United States. Yeah. Now by 1750, the enslaved Africans constituted about 20% of the population in British North America, which um, is the United States, and the majority of them lived in southern colonies. Mm-hmm. Now, because England's industrial revolution was founded uh by profits from the British slave trade, and also from colonial americans slaves that produced sugar and tobacco crops um these ships that were coming in were bringing in around 50,000 enslaved africans 
to the new world each year by 1790. Okay, so what does that say? It's like always about money. You know, DV, it always kind of turns out to be about money, about greed, and, and how much can they get. Yeah. Um, the interesting thing, though, with this is that in the French-dominated New Orleans, which kind of uh, was founded in 1718, yes. slavery took a different kind of cultural turn. Mm -hmm. There were free colored people uh, called Creoles that existed. Uh, they actually coexisted with whites and slaves. And these Creoles were racially mixed uh, children of French slave masters yeah. and African uh, women, okay, that were slaved. And uh, these biracial children were given a lot of privileges. Uh, they were uh, often sent to some great schools, the finest schools, and they were trained as musicians, mm -hmm. and they were also allowed access to white society. Now, the Creoles were able to achieve opportunities in society and wealth that approximated the status of uh, and the rights of whites at that time. Now, of course, <laughs> all that changed when the Spaniards <laughs> took over in New Orleans in 1764. And so then at that point, all the Creoles, they lost all of their social and economic status. And so they had to now go out and work. And a lot of them became traveling musicians. And this phenomena, of course, with them traveling, would evolve into the Southern minstrel shows. Mm -hmm. um, it's also believed that Creole musicians and their descendants were um, uh, primarily the inventors of jazz, okay? And one other point I wanted to make is that also in 1774, the first law prohibiting slavery was passed. And that was thanks to Quaker women, uh, of the actions of Quaker women in the North, like Rhode Island and everything. Okay, so now, here we are. We've got 11 million <laughs> Africans have been forcibly taken from their homeland, yeah. and an estimated 600,000 have been sold into slavery in North America by 1807, mm -hmm. when the British abolished slavery. Now, one thing I always felt was interesting was that the interesting fact is that between 1798 and to 1808, mm -hmm. that was the largest slave importation into the United States. Even though the United States were prohibited from uh, exporting slaves, the slave trade just kind of continued in, in uh, the United States despite that. Mm -hmm. So now you got 1860, 12 million American slaves that are there. Okay, so now you're saying, okay, what does that have to do with jazz and jazz? Well, um, what I will be demonstrating throughout this like series is that there is a theme of inequality that is found throughout the history of jazz, which I felt is the fuel, so to speak, that influenced and, and drove it in the directions that it took. And uh, there is a belief that jazz is stemmed from the blues, that it's the root of jazz music. Mm -hmm. um, the African tradition made use of a, a single line melody uh, called call and response pattern. But right. with the European concept of harmonies, rhythms reflected African speech patterns. And the Africans' use of pentatonic scales led to blues notes in blues and in jazz. So now I'm going to start with the blues part uh, before I, because that's a real key factor in how it evolved mm -hmm. and how we get to the jazz and the singing. Blues is kind of born in the South, and it evolved from hymns, work songs, and field hollers, okay? Right. And those were used to uh, everything. It was used in everything, from working in the field, uh, like to ease the drudgery so that slaves weren't bored with the repetitive work that they were doing. A lot of the slave masters and overseers wanted to make sure they knew where the slaves were all the time, so they wanted them to sing. Uh, uh -huh. of whenever they were out there. Yeah, a lot of people don't know that. And they also used music, uh, these these uh, songs for their spiritual and their social events. Um, an interesting thing that I discovered in putting this together was that slaves were not permitted to uh, have musical uh, instruments, especially drums, because uh, there was this fear that they might use it to communicate, or organize, and create uprisings yeah. on neighboring plantations. But in any case, these songs and these chants that they had provided an outlet for them to express, uh, you know, the pain of loss of loved ones and justice and also to express, uh, you know, victories over hardships. 
So going back, um, blues as being the foundation of jazz, blues is also, just to kind of go off a little bit before we get into it, is also uh, the foundation of rhythm and blues, rock and roll, mm -hmm. country, pop, mm -hmm. heavy metal, pretty much most of the American music. Now, in the latter uh, segments of these programs, I'll discuss more about, in specific details, about blues singers. But um, in keeping with the timeline, I would like to make one more mention of the 1800s. Right. Now, uh, predominantly during this time, although not exclusive, there were these things called minstrel shows. And that was where white performers were in blackface and they were parroting African Americans, yeah. their customs, degrading and human. You know, you, you're familiar with that. They were racist, the stereotype, they mocked black people, their slang and their speech. Uh, and they really weren't interested in African Americans performing. Uh, but there were some whites that were interested in mm -hmm. black song dance that were actually performed by African Americans. And these white performers started copying that. So in uh, just to give you a, a, a something to look up, in 1840 and 50, there were two guys, William Lance and Thomas Dilward, and they became the first African Americans to perform on the minstrel stage. Because mm -hmm. before that, it was only whites that did that. Okay, and they used that to talk about their freedom and uh, and that, that, that they were the most, they were the authentic uh, uh, African-Americans that people could, could come to see. Now, um, I mention all these facts uh, to demonstrate the evolution of jazz and jazz singers because these are really, really important. Uh, and as we go along in the different episodes, you'll understand and you'll see how they are connected, this kind of way that African-Americans were viewed and how um, they were, there was a lot of inequality and injustice and dehumanization. So now, let me get to what is jazz. I know you've been waiting. Okay, one, one question, one question. Oh, what about vaudeville? Vaudeville. Vaudeville, okay. Uh, that's going to be actually addressed more into uh, the 1900s uh, because that's kind of when that occurred. Okay. Uh, and it came out of minstrel, vaudeville actually stemmed from minstrel music. Okay. But there was an evolution that occurred in that, and that's going to be in our next episode. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, in this episode, I promised you <laughs> that I would give you a definition of jazz. Okay. And jazz vaudeville. Well, so, uh, you have another question? Um, actually, I have a lot of questions, but I will be yeah. asking you all these questions in our next episode. Okay. So, okay. Um, I just kind of wanted to give you a little bit of the history um, yeah. because it is a key to uh, jazz. Right. I think it's very important also for people to know that before we start learning a discipline, to know the history behind it, right? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So, Veronica, um, mm -hmm. we'll be meeting again then in our next episode. Yes. Right? Yes. very soon and then the, in the meantime i'm going to just say bye bye to the to our viewer okay okay but you're still online so yes keep smiling still... keep smiling <laughs> <laughs> absolutely okay um anda bersama saya dan veronica nan dari new york usa dan kita akan berjumpa kembali di episode berikutnya dengan tema Jazz Vocals di Daya Indonesia Fine Arts Academy Diva Channel. Salam musikal. <tik>